I'm going to ask my good friend Sam Palmer to uh, read the passage for us this morning. Thanks. Good morning. We're reading from Philippians chapter 2, uh, verses 12 through 18. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything, everything, without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God, without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky, as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain, but even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice... And service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Word of the Lord. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, you can actually take it right here. Um, Before we begin this morning, my deepest condolences to you Dodgers fans. Um... (laughs) It's very sad, especially to the ones who had to skip Thursday night Bible study to watch the game. I don't know where, I don't know where he's sitting. (laughs) How many of you have ever um, complained before? You ever, you ever complained about something before? Why do we complain? Why, why do we find ourselves? complaining or grumbling or arguing? Well, uh, James, in his book, says that it comes from the war that's being waged inside the members of our body. But it's more than that. We complain and we argue because it's cathartic. It feels good to us to complain. Um, Another word for it that's a little more PC would be venting. I'm just venting. I'm telling it as it is. I'm truth-telling. And the truth is, there's entire empires built upon complaining, and they're known today as the news. The news. Do you guys remember when Dave Clark gave his testimony about uh, taking a break from the news? He talked about fasting from the news and how healthy that was for his brain and for his heart. And that's because when you participate in the news today, it often leads you to anger, bitterness, rage, maybe confusion most of the time. But then you find yourself participating in what talking heads on any of the news channels, because it's a 24-hour cycle, what they end up doing. And it's, it's actually complaining. Well, then you find yourself speaking that way, thinking that way, talking to your fellow man that way, complaining and arguing. We complain and we argue because it's easy to do, but we're also conditioned to do it. It's what the world does when the world is frustrated. It's what a world, as Paul describes as crooked and depraved, participates in on a daily basis. We're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 2 today, and Paul tells us that complaining and arguing is the opposite behavior of a true Christian who has experienced salvation. So before we dive in, I want to pray. Father, I need your power to speak the truth. I am fully dependent upon you, Spirit, to be used as a mouthpiece. I pray that you would enlighten all of our hearts. Help us to see this truth in your word. Help it to not just to speak to us in our hearts, but that it would make its way to our mouths, to our hands and our feet, that we would live this way. God, we love you. We devote ourselves to you now by the hearing of your word. Help us to understand it. Help us to appropriate it, to put it on, to to take it in. Help us to work out what you have 
worked in. We love you, God, and we pray these things in your name. Amen. Um, I probably say this every week, but this is an extremely important passage. Um, and Paul gives us another therefore, which we're going to look at. So the passage is chapter 2, verse 12 through 18. It's just seven short verses. But I found myself this week when I was writing my notes trying to boil down what I really wanted to spend the most time on because this passage is so thick with truth. So let's start with the therefore and look back a little bit, see what Paul has just said. So the first thing that we want to look at is remind ourselves of the immediate context. So the immediate context is just chapter 2. And he begins by saying, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if you remember what it means to be united with Christ, in the same way that you are united with Christ in his death and in his resurrection, you've been brought from spiritual death to spiritual life, you now have fellowship with God, but you also have fellowship and you strive toward unity with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And this was the, the theme of last week's passage, unity in Christ. Your unity comes from your identity. Because you have experienced a new identity in Christ, being alive in Christ, and your fellow believer has experienced being alive in Christ, well, you have everything in common in that way. You have a new heart. You will experience the resurrection of new life. And that life begins right now. It's not just some far-off promise. It's a promise that has begun right now in your life. And in that way, you can have unity with the body. How do you have unity? Well, you emulate the humility of Christ by laying aside your selfish ambition and your vain conceit and bearing the cross as Jesus did. You live like Jesus did in all humility. Who He was God by very nature, but did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, made himself nothing, became a servant, and was obedient. He was obedient. That's something that we're going to look at today. All the way till death on a cross. And then finally, um, the last couple of things, the exaltation of Christ. We saw that last week too, that because Jesus fulfilled the will of the Father, the Father exalted him. He gave him the name that is above every name, and all, everyone will bow. All knees will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And in some ways that's scary, and it's also incredible. Because the whole world will acknowledge that this is true. That all along, this was true. That Jesus really is who he says he is. That he's God in the flesh. That he made a way for sinful creatures to have communion with a holy God. And the reason it's scary is because there are many, many people who do not know this truth and don't know this reality. And that you and I are to be about bringing the kingdom to bear because all will kneel to the king. We, as citizens of heaven, as citizens of this kingdom, have a huge responsibility with our talents, our gifts, our time, our energy, our money, our resources. We are to submit to the will of God in obedience and share the gospel with those in need. Those are, that's everyone who is in darkness. And so Paul gives us this interesting phrase. He says, verse 12, Therefore, dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your salvation. First, I want to look at what this phrase does not mean, because I think this is extremely important. This is, this is a foundational doctrine for all believers to understand. It does not mean that you can earn your salvation, that salvation is by works. And let's turn to these passages, grab your Bible, you can keep your finger right there in Philippians, you don't have to go very far for Ephesians, just go back one book, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, we're going to look at 8 through 10. Again, this is Paul, still in prison, to the book, uh, or to the church in Ephesus, he says, For it is by grace you have been saved. Remember, grace is a gift given by God to you. It's a gift that you don't deserve. It is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So our salvation is not a means of us working to get salvation. God has done that salvific work in our hearts already, and we are to work it out. We're going to talk about what that means in a second. I want to continue with these uh, proof texts here. Turn to Romans, so back a few books. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. It says this, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous. Righteous means you have a right relationship with God. No one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, the law, by the law, we become conscious of sin. We can't become rescued or saved by working. And by obeying the law, the law that God's given us. As long as we're good enough, God will consider us good and save us. No, that's not how it works. You are rescued unto good works. Ephesians just said that. And this says, by following the law and looking at the law, you actually see in a deeper and greater way just how depraved we actually are and how much we actually need God and his power to overcome sin. God is the one who does that work in us so that we can show that our salvation is true, that it's real. And finally, Titus 3, 5. This one's a little trickier. Turn toward the back of your Bible. First and second Timothy and then Titus. Titus 3, 5 says this. He saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. So if grace is God giving you a gift you don't deserve, mercy is you do deserve punishment because of your sin, but God didn't give that to you. Instead, he sent his son, his one and only son who he loved, to this earth to rescue you. It's not just a gift you didn't deserve. You you don't receive the punishment that you do deserve. Instead, he poured out that punishment on his son on the cross when Jesus shed his blood for you. He continues and he says, He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. Jesus is our sin bearer. He's the one who took our sin upon himself so that we could live a new life. So what does it mean then to work out your salvation in fear and trembling? True salvation begins with God's work in you. Look at these phrases here in Philippians. It says, to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Verse 13, for it is who? God, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. So first, there's a work that's being done in you, a work that has been done in you and continues to be done in you throughout the process of being sanctified or set apart unto good works. That salvation that began in you will be completed to the end. You remember the very first part of Philippians, Philippians chapter 1? He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. That good work that began in you is your salvation. And you work out what has been worked in. So true salvation produces transformation. You know that you've been saved because you're being transformed and changed because of something that's been done inside of you, a work that's been been done in you. And that true transformation that's taking place leads to obedience. Obedience. This is why Paul begins this passage by saying, therefore, dear friends, as you have always obeyed, he wants you to see the connection of faith and salvation with works and obedience. If you've truly been saved, you will be obedient and do that work. So this idea of work, he describes as when you live it out, it looks like this. Work it out with fear and trembling. Fear 
and trembling. Now, the Greek words for, for these words, fear and trembling, looks like this. Fear is a holy reverence of God. A holy reverence of God. You look at God and you see his power and his majesty and his might and his glory. And you look at yourself, a sinful, depraved person in need of a savior, and you bow in holy reverence to him through your actions, by your obedience. You have a holy reverence for God, a deep gratitude for who God is, the person and work of Jesus. And then trembling, this, this is really interesting. This Greek word means that you're weak because of the lack of sustenance. Like, uh, I, get, uh, I get hangry sometimes, just ask my wife. And I used to get really hypoglycemic. Um, I'm not sure why that stopped, but probably because I went gluten-free. But when I, when I get hungry, I would get shaky, and I would feel weak because of a lack of food. That's what this is talking about. God is your sustenance. Jesus and the word of God is your daily bread. And without it, you should feel the weakness that comes along with it. You should be able to look in your life and say, man, I just can't seem to overcome this sin. I can't seem to get along with this person. I can't seem to get through this struggle without being angry at God. You're weak with dependence. Paul says, work it out with fear and trembling. Another way to understand this, working it out, um, looks like this. So I used to lead worship at uh, the church that we planted in Iowa, Bethany Farm. And I'd always be up there with my guitar, ready, ready to go. And one day, I walked up to the front, was ready to sit, and I said, good morning, Bethany Farm. How are you guys doing? And then and everybody, all of a sudden... I got an idea for a song, to, a song to write, like a musical phrase and a lyric. And I was like, why does this always happen at the most inopportune times? And, I, and so I said, greet your neighbor. And I turned around, and everybody's talking to each other. And I turned around, and I grabbed my phone, and I hit record. And I was like, da, 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 da. you know, Mary and And I was like saying the lyric and the line inspiration struck. But what I knew was that I, I, I couldn't do it right then, but I knew I was going to, the church was going to get over, I was going to go home, and for hours, I was going to sit down at my computer with my guitar and all my recording equipment, and I was going to work out what had been an inspiration inside of me. It was going to take a lot of work, I was going to have to get all the guitar tones right. I was going to have to make sure all the lyrics were right. I was going to have to make sure that this song was going to sound like what it sounded like in my head. And my wife knows how this goes. She has an idea of what she wants to paint, but she, it's labor. It's work to make it a reality. This is, this is what it means to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You're totally dependent on the power of God. Now, it's... It's very different in this. The, the true work is finished. When Jesus hung on the cross, that was the work complete, being completed, and he said, it is finished. I'm so grateful that that was done because there's no amount of effort or labor that we could put in to make our salvation secure. Jesus does that for us. And in this passage, Paul says, look at what Jesus did on the cross. Have a holy reverence for God, for the work that he's done in your life. And what it should lead to is a life of obedience. Now, we've talked about this uh, in previous sermons in this book. We live in a crooked and depraved generation. Paul describes his culture. 2,000 years ago, as crooked and depraved. Can we do that with our generation? Yes, we 100%. You guys remember Song of Solomon? You know, yes, he told us that that's what it's going to look like because there's nothing new under the sun. Every new generation will find a new way to perform the heinous acts of sin. 
We live in a crooked and depraved generation. And the way that a crooked and depraved generation deals with their own depravity and their disagreement and their arguments is they speak like this. They complain and they argue. It's interesting that this is the first thing that Paul says after what it means to work out your, your, uh, your salvation. He says, verse 14, do everything without complaining or arguing. He could have said all kinds of things, but what's it connecting to? It's connecting to our immediate context, which is unity in the body. Because Paul's saying, look, the whole world is devoted to complaining and arguing. The whole world looks like this. That's the way they problem solve. But you, dear Christian, brothers and sisters in Christ, you don't look like that. You have something very different. You speak very differently. You have the word of life. You have the word of life. And my mom shared this verse with me this week, and I thought it was so perfect. In the book of Amos, this is a prophecy. Look at this prophecy. The days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. We are in a famine. Our culture is in a truth famine. Now, years ago, when Time uh, magazine put on their cover, Is God Dead? Kind of a reflection of Nietzsche's idea that, that God is dead in our culture. Well, years later, uh, this was about 20 years ago, Time magazine came out with another cover that said, Is Truth Dead? I would venture to say in our culture, truth is dead because truth is relative to everyone in the world. This is why if you go online, you can see the vitriol with, with which people talk to each other. They completely talk, talk past one another. Be, why? Because they're standing upon whose truth? Their truth. They are standing upon their truth. And 2020 further entrenched us in this idea that we can dive deeper and deeper into our own echo chambers. We can cancel out anybody we don't want to hear. And we can only listen to the voices that we agree with so that we don't have to grapple with the world. That's not how believers interact with the world. We don't use the tactics of the world to overcome Paul says it's very different. He says, do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you will shine like stars in the universe. In which you will shine like stars in the universe. Do you know where light shines the brightest? In the places where it is the darkest. It only takes one single candle to light a completely dark room. Paul says, this is the word of life. And you, brothers and sisters in Christ, have the words of life. What would happen if we spent more time devoting ourselves to understanding the depths of the scriptures instead of understanding the various arguments that the world has to offer? What would happen if we spent more time devoted to one another and talking to each other in person than trying to argue with someone that we don't even know online? My brother-in-law, Jared, he's brilliant. He's an idea machine. He's incredible. He had this brilliant idea for a TV show, and I can't remember what he was going to call it, but man, I wish it was a real TV show. And what, what he would do, what the show would be, is he would have two people who are having a horrible argument online with each other, two total strangers, having like a knockdown, drag out fight online. He would find those two people and he would invite them separately without either of them knowing to come to dinner with him. And he would sit down with these two people. They would not know what the TV show was about. The cameras would be rolling. And they'd be talking to each other and they would get to know one another. What's your family like? Where'd you grow up? 
Tell me about your job. What are the, some of the things you love? What are your hobbies? They would get to know each other, and they would talk to each other, get to laughing. And then Jared would pull out a piece of paper and say, on June 13th, 2021, you said to Bill this. How would they react? Don't you think things would be a little different? Why? It's because online arguing removes something crucial. It, remo it removes the humanity of an argument. It removes the face-to-face, -face, the nuances of your face, the tone of your voice, the inflection. This is why the church, the body of Christ, is supposed to gather every week. And this is why Paul warns us against disunity. He said, because the world out there, they, has a, they, they have a way of doing things. And it's to tear each other down and to tear each other apart. But what if the church was devoted to building one another up and knowing the word of God so well that we were actually able to hold out the words of life? We don't even need to come up with, you know, clever sounding arguments. We don't need to. We just need to memorize the truths of scripture and we need to kindly, gently, and in a way that encourages people, hold out the word of life and it becomes a light, a beacon in the darkness in which you will shine like stars in the universe. You see what Paul's getting at here? Unity starts with this idea that we are all on the same page because something's happened to us. Salvation has been done inside of us, and we want to work out what has been worked in. Paul says this in Romans chapter 1, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. You don't need to know clever sounding arguments. You don't need to know all the nuances of the world. You have to know the word of God. You have to know the word of God. Why? Because that's where the power lies. It's right here. I've been in situations where I've been in deep conversation with someone who is an unbeliever, and I was about to share the gospel with them, and I was thinking of the, the most clever way I could say something, and instead I would just say, um, you know, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. I've, I've said this, uh, this is a true story. I said that exact thing, and I chose simply to just to use the words of Scripture. And it blew their minds. He, he was actually dangling up in a tree at that time uh, in a harness, cutting down a branch when I told him. So I was like, can't go anywhere. <laughs> Captive audience. And, uh, so, and he said, what does that mean? What does that mean? Something was happening inside of his heart. Light was penetrating the darkness. Working out your salvation in fear and trembling means that you recognize you don't have any power. You might be the most clever man in the room, but without God's power being worked in you, you'll never work out your salvation in fear and trembling. You'll just depend upon yourself, and it will fall flat. The Word of God is so powerful. Trust the Word of God. So if the world's way, the crooked and depraved way, is complaining and arguing and trying to convince someone by arguing, it's just not going to work. The way of God's people is that we hold out the word of life, trusting that its power is going to transform hearts and minds. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. It's going to require that you get up at 5.30 on Thursday to go to a men's Bible study which I still think is ridiculous to get up that early to do. It's going to require that you set aside some time to read your Bible every single day. It's going to require that you memorize the words of the scriptures. It's work. It's labor. It requires you to set aside your selfish ambition and your vain conceit and pour yourself into the word of God. And Paul says, even if I am being poured out like a drink offering... Verse 17, on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. It's a sacrifice. 
You have to sacrifice your time, your energy, your money, your resources. You have to sacrifice the things that you desire in order to acquire the power of God you need to speak the truth into the lives of other, others and bring the gospel to bear. God wants you to experience this power. He wants you to know this power and live out this power and be the light you were intended to be as a Christian, as a follower of Christ. It requires sacrifice. And he says, listen, this sacrifice is so worth it. A drink offering uh, in the Old Testament is what the Hebrew priests would do, and they would mix uh, wine with oil, and they would pour it out on the, a burnt offering, and it would, it would be like a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Have you ever been cooking with uh, really great sauces, and you can just smell that aroma? A drink offering means that you are giving up your life in such a way that when the Lord sees it, he goes, ah, yes, yes, you are bringing the kingdom to bear. Some of you have gone through horrible suffering in this room. Some of you have had deep injustices done against you. And it is hard to trust God. It is hard to believe that God is going to do a work in you or that he has even done a work in you. I promise you, brother and sister, I promise you that God will continue to work in you and through you and that you can work out what has been done in. You have to trust God that your sacrifice, that your suffering is not pointless, that it's not worthless. And Paul says, rejoice with me. I'm in prison. And I rejoice because I remember spiritual prison. And I've been set free from spiritual prison. I've been brought into the light. And now I am light. I'm participating in that light. And there are prison guards here who are becoming believers. And they're becoming believers and their families are becoming believers. I'm I'm witnessing to the Praetorian Guard, and the emperors of Rome are hearing the truth of Christ, and it's making them really mad, and they're causing suffering for you guys, but we know that means the gospel's going forward. We know that means that the kingdom of God is being brought to bear. He says, so you too, verse 18, should be glad and rejoice with me. As citizens of heaven, we have a a deep intrinsic longing and great hope that cannot be squelched. It's the hope of the the resurrection unto eternal life with the king of glory. That's our ultimate hope. But we get to experience it partially here and now. And we see it as we begin to work out our salvation in fear and trembling. We begin to see things changing in our life. Our priorities change. The things that we desire change. Our community with other other people changes so that we, we want to be around people we don't actually really like. We start to enjoy community and unity with one another because we're all being joined together with one goal, to bring God's kingdom to bear as citizens, as citizens of heaven. It is going to be work. Working out your salvation will be work. But praise be to God that the most difficult work has already been done in you and it will be done through you, and God will, will complete that work that has begun in you. Are you working? Are you working out your salvation in fear and trembling? Are you totally dependent on God's power to do that work? Let's beg God that we could be reminded of the work that we have to do and praise God for the work that he's already done in us. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We love you because you first loved us. And we work out our salvation because you have already done that work in us. It's so easy to complain. It's so easy to argue. Uh, It's the way we're conditioned culturally. It's the the way the, the things we hear day in and day out. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be as devoted to your word as we are perhaps to the news. That that we would be influenced by your word in a deeper and more profound way than we are influenced by social media. God, that we would submit to your will and do your work your way. We can't do that of our own volition, of our own power. 
we are powerless to bring the gospel to bear without you. And Father, I pray that you would help us to be devoted to you in every way. Thank you for this truth. Thank you for this word. May it be true of us. We love you, God. And we pray these things in your awesome, powerful name. Amen.